Good morning, church. Welcome to worship this morning. I guess it can be any time of the day you're watching this because it's a video. And I'm so excited that I had the opportunity to come and say hello to you all. It wasn't until this COVID season that I actually realized how much I love you all and I miss you. Uh, I, I used to complain to Johnson sometimes on a Sunday and I'll say, well, look, can I sleep in, you know, and then I'll come to church in the evening or something. Just, you know, because I was overtired, but it's during this period that actually even the kids are asking, when are we going to church? So you realize how much you take for granted on a daily basis. Anyway, welcome. It's, I hope you're all keeping well, and it's great to be able to come and pray with you this morning. I'll start our service by reading of the Psalm 16, verse 1. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Let us pray. Almighty and all-powerful God, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you as a church. We thank you for the means that you have given us that the word can still reach us even in our homes. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you, Lord, that we can take refuge in you for you keep us safe. Father God, amongst us, not all of us are happy. We have members of this church, e.g. Barbara Lampert, who has left us at this time. She has come to you to relax and to rest in your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that some of us haven't been well during this time, not necessarily because of the COVID, but just unwell, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially. And so, Father, we come before you, before we even hear the word that you have for us this morning, that is so assuring to us, the story of the Good Shepherd one who knows us by name. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. We ask you to be with each one of us. Call us out by name. Help us in our needs. Touch our lives. Touch our families. We haven't seen our children in Cairns for quite some time. Touch them. And I'm sure everyone else shouts out their children's name this afternoon or morning, saying, touch them. Be with them. Keep them safe especially those with babies, keep them safe. We pray for our elderly, those who are particularly in nursing homes, keep them safe. We pray for our frontline staff, Lord Jesus, especially those who have access and exposure to this COVID season, keep us safe. Keep us safe, particularly as we may bring this terrible pandemic to our families. Lord Jesus Christ, as we look on the news and we see what's happening, we take refuge in you, knowing that you, O oh Lord, have loved us so much that you called us your own. We thank you for the minister, Johnson. We thank you for all the people who have been working so hard to make sure we receive this word weekly. We thank you for... Ben and everyone who's editing the videos and making sure they get to us right. Pastor Chris, Andrew, bless them, Lord. They also want your touch. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I shall now call Pastor Johnson to, or oh Ben actually, I think he's coming to read the word of God. Thank you very much, and what a wonderful day. Praise the Lord. Today we'll be reading from John 10, 1 to 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads, leads them out. When he has bought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, 
for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out to find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Now I'd like to call Johnson to come. Uh, I just want to thank you, Ben, for the reading. That was really great. And we, we want to, to come together as we hear the word of God. I want you to pay attention so that you don't miss anything. It's very important as we listen to the word of God. Let us pray. We remember Jesus, the door for those looking for the way ahead, for those who think the door is closed to them, for prisoners and those kept locked away, for those who want to come in here but don't know how, for those that we might respond to Jesus as the door and be ready to open and welcome others in. Father, we just want to thank you for you call each one of us by name and you want us to live lives that are safe and healthy. We pray for places where people cannot live safely. We pray for those countries where coronavirus is ravaging, where there are no medication, where we don't have the medication even for the coronavirus. We pray for those who are suffering from different illnesses. Father, we pray that you are God and that you'll be able to heal them through your name. Father, we pray that without you we can't do anything. But with you, we are more than conquerors. So be with us, Father, in our service and in the world around us. Be with them, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, from the book of uh, John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. And the theme that I'm going to move with you today is, which door should I take? Which door should I take? I am the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. John 10 verse 9 in the Revised Standard Version. That's the way the Revised Standard Version translates the more familiar words of Jesus. I am the door. Let us consider these words in the light of the customs and pastoral imagery of Jesus' day to see if new light can be pushed upon them. We might begin by considering a Palestinian shepherd. In the east, the shepherd goes before the sheep, leading them, not driving them from behind. The shepherd leads the sheep into the shelter of the sheepfold in the valley where they will spend the night. So the shepherd fold is made of four high, rough walls with thorns placed around the top to keep out thieves who might otherwise attempt to climb over. In one of the walls, there is a space a little larger than a man's body. The shepherd proceeds his sheep, stands in the gate in the wall, facing outwards and calls his sheep by name as they come over the hillside. He examines each sheep carefully for bruises and bruises. If a sheep has bruised his head from a hitting a rock or being battered by another sheep, the shepherd rubs oil onto the wound. Thou anointest my head with oil. If sheep is thirsty, the shepherd gives him a drink. Only after the shepherd is certain that each sheep is all right, does he allow it to enter into the sheepfold. 
After the sheep are settled in, the shepherd builds a fire in the entrance, eats his evening meal, and watches his sheep by night. Then he wraps himself in his cloak and lies down across the entrance. And that is very normal for the shepherds in Israel. So the sheep, therefore, have no need to fear. For robbers cannot come over the walls, and wild animals will not anger because of their fear of the fire. And in addition, an intruder would have to pass by not only the fire, but the board of the shepherd lying across the entrance. Thus for the sheep, their shepherd is literally the door, or the gate to the sheepfold. Now, we can see the background of Jesus, swears in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. I am the good shepherd. He says, and again, I am the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The ways are not contradictory to each other, but complementary. Again, we are confronted with that troubling sense of exclusiveness which John puts on the lips of Jesus. We confront it all in Jesus' ways in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here in chapter 10, we find Jesus saying, Not I am a dog, but rather I am the dog. He is not one among men, but he's unique. He's unique. He's unique. I'm going to talk to you today about the single most important door that anyone in this lifetime will ever decide whether or not to walk through. It is a door that has no hinges, no knobs, no locks, and doesn't swing out or in. This door is a person named Jesus Christ. He is the door. Today we'll examine the I am statement of our Lord Jesus found in the Gospel of St. John. Each statement tells us who Jesus is and who he came to be. Because of who he is and who he can become to us, we can have the two things in life that every person is looking for. Every person is looking for security. Every person is looking for significance. So that is the things we are going to look at. The vast majority of people go through life achieving neither security nor significance. Years ago, a psychologist named James C. Coleman wrote that as the modern day person struggles with the baffling question of his own existence, science falls short of providing full answers. It can tell how, but not why. There are times when science cannot come with answers, and only God can provide us with answers. He then made the, this observation, with the advent of the space age, man is confronted with a new perspective of time and space and the problem of finding the meaning of his existence in a universe in which the earth and even the whole solar system may be no longer in relation to the world than an atom is to the earth. At the same time, Materialistic values based on the belief that scientific progress would automatically lead to immense happiness and fulfillment are proved sadly disillusioned. As a result, many people are groping about, bewildered and bitter, unable to find an enduring faith or to develop a satisfying philosophy of life. Despite their fine automobiles, well-stocked refrigerators and other material possessions and comforts, the meaning of life seems to be evading them. In essence, they are suffering from existential anxiety, deep concern about finding values which will enable them to live satisfying, fulfilling, meaningful and significant lives. People are wondering, why am I here on earth for? They cannot find the significance, the meaning of life. The only ones who can read the Bible, who can have a relationship with Jesus, would find the meaning of life. Nobody understands you better than God. Nobody understands the need to feel significant and to believe that your life matters than God. 
Jesus uttered four ways that give us one of the key secrets to finding significance in life, and they are, I am the door. John 10 verse 9, I am the door. That is what he's saying. In fact, he actually made the statement twice in just a few seconds to emphasize the fact of his being the door. In full, this is what he said. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, you will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. This is what Jesus says to us. His listeners would have immediately known what he was talking about. But let me help you explain it a bit to you. Jesus had just finished telling the people that he was the good shepherd. But they did not really understand exactly what he was saying because verse 6 says, this figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them. But they did not understand what those things which he had been saying to them. In verse 6, Jesus tries another comparison, another metaphor. He compares himself to the door of the sheep. In Israel, there were two kinds of sheep, sheepfolds, as explained above. There was one that would be near a village or a town. It was fold, a fold for the sheep of all the shepherds. The owners of the sheep would pool their resources and hire someone to guard the sheep. He would only let those shepherds whom he knew personally that owned the flock that he was going to be guarding. The other kind of sheepfold was out in the hills and away from the village. It was a walled enclosure where on three sides there would be rocks piled out a foot high with no roof and there would be a small opening which is about five to six feet tall where the sheep would enter at night. So the shepherd would lie down in front of that opening and literally become the door of the sheep. Nothing could go in unless the shepherd allowed it and no sheep could live unless the shepherd allowed it. And that is what we are hearing from the scriptures. That he is the door. If you get a chance to go to Israel, where I once have been, been you can still see the sheep falls out in the desert. Particularly the road that leads from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. One of the most amazing sights you will ever see is a flock of sheep following the shepherd. They simply go wherever the shepherd leads and they put their complete trust in the sheep, shepherd. It is amazing to watch these sheep let in the day be headed into their sheepfold where the shepherd would then lie down and literally become the door of the sheep. As the door of the sheep, the shepherd gives sheep the two things that everybody on this earth is looking for. The first one, security. The sheep know they are safe as long as the shepherd is guarding the door. And it's significant by the very fact that the shepherd is willing to lay down his very body. For the sheep tells us we need to know about how important sheep are. If Jesus lays his body by the door and becomes the door, it tells us how important sheep are. And that is very important for us to know. The shepherd is there, their protector, and the sheep is their provider. That is why I continue to say to you through this entire sermon that true significance and lasting significance can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. One of Jesus' favorite ways to teach was to refer to some ordinary, everyday object that people were very familiar with to reveal extraordinary truth. You would take an earthly object and give it a, a heavenly meaning. He does that with some, something that everyone listening encounters multiplies times every day and is using just a door. You come across a door every day, every day of our life. How many times we open our doors? I don't know. But so many times. Now we have to ask you the question, why did Jesus refer to himself as a door? If you think about it, there's only one of two things you can do with a door. Open it from the outside and to walk into it. Or I can open it from the inside and to walk out of a room. 
So a door is basically either an exit or an entrance. And that is exactly what Jesus is going to tell us in this passage of scripture. Anytime you walk through a door, you automatically enter into one place and exit on another one. The secret to finding significance in this life is to make sure you walk through the door named Jesus Christ. Why? Because every single day you live with Christ. And through Jesus, you can exit a meaningless life. You can exit a million, a meaningless life. Every single day, there's six plus billion people on this planet choose to walk through doors. Doors of marriage, doors of friendship, doors of having children, doors of spending money, doors of accepting jobs. If you are married, you are married to a particular person you live with. And because you choose to walk through that person's door rather than someone else's door, you have chosen to walk through their door. If you talk to any business leader, anyone who had, had financial success, talk to anyone who had, had a good marriage, talk to anyone who has what they call, call a life of fulfillment and meaningfulness and significance, they will all tell you it was a matter of walking through the right doors. On the other hand, there are young teenagers who spend the rest of their life behind bars because they walk through the wrong door. There are people today in miserable marriages because they walk through the wrong door. There is nothing more frustrating than to walk through what you think is the right door. The door that will finally lead to significance and contentment and peace and fulfillment of satisfaction and to only find it is the wrong door. You are thinking you are moving in the right door. You think you find the wrong right door, but only to realize it is the wrong door. I spend most of my life ministering to people and dealing with people who are trapped in a life of emptiness and meaninglessness because they thought a certain door would hold the right answer, but it didn't. It's not the right door. After saying that he was the door of the sheep, Jesus made this statement in verse 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. John 10 verse 8. God wants every one of us to live lives of significance and satisfaction. But wrong doors are robbers and thieves. Wrong doors will steal peace and joy and happiness and contentment and satisfaction from you. There are several doors that people walk through every day thinking this is the right door for me. This is the door that will give me significance and meaning and joy and happiness in life only to find it is the wrong door. How many of us have tried this door? How many of us have tried this door? Here is a man that walked through the door that he thought was the right one, but it was a door that led to nowhere. This man tried the door called money, power, influence, but it was the wrong door. There are men out there that certainly cannot relate to this door. As wonderful as family is, and family is so important, family alone cannot give you significance and satisfaction. No, it will not. Many of us have walked through wrong doors in our lives. But it is never too late to exit the wrong door and walk through the right door. Through Jesus, you can exit a meaningless life. That is why he said in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. That is what Jesus is saying. Look at what Jesus said when uh, said what happens to anyone who comes to him and enters through him. First of all, you will be saved. That is, you will have a relationship with God that will never end. You will have a relationship with God that will give you satisfaction. You will be safe because when, he, when sheep can go in and out without fear, it is because they feel safe. Then you'll be satisfied because all that sheep need to be satisfied is green pasture, green grass, which is found in any pasture. 
Now you can understand why Jesus made the following statement. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Isn't that great to know that? I often wondered why Jesus would call himself the dog. And then shift gears and start talking about having an abundant, meaningful, significant life. When you come to the door marked Jesus, you don't only exit a meaningless life, but you would go through a very meaningful life. When you exit the meaningless life through the door given to you by Jesus, you'll be walking through the meaningful life. You can now enter into a new door. Remember I told you that when you walk through a door, two things always happen. You exit one room and you enter into another. Jesus is telling us that when you come to him, either for the first time as a non-follower of Christ or on a daily basis as one who is already a follower of Christ, you exit a life of frustration and enter a life of fulfillment. You exit a life of meaninglessness and enter a life of meaningfulness. So that is what we need as Christians. When he said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, the thief is all the wrong doors you can walk through. If you walk through the wrong door of greedy, lust, jealousy, selfishness, it will suck the joy out of your life. It will rob you of significance and it will ultimately wind up killing you. When you enter into the door named Jesus Christ, you enter into a life that is far more than Ferreras, Mercedes Benz, any cars, and one night stands. You enter into a life of joy and peace and satisfaction that you can't find anywhere else. Do you notice how Jesus made a difference between life and the abundant life? He said in verse 10, My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. To give life in all its fullness. That is his purpose. Abundant life in Christ. So the sad fact is that most people go through this life and they exit, but they don't live. They just exist. A lot of people don't, don't live like they just exist. Jesus didn't put on you, you on this earth just to take up space. Live a few years and die without any impact whatsoever. He wants every one of us to live a significant life. A life of importance. A life of influence that never ends. That is what Jesus is calling us to be. Isn't that what you want for your life? Don't you want a life that counts? Don't you want a life to enjoy a life that is to its fullest? The key is making sure you walk through the right door. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that is the name. When you surrender your life to him and allow him to be the shepherd of your life, and then on a daily basis you come to the word of God and you feed on the bread of life and every day by following his will for your life and seeking to live for him and his glory, you continuously walk through his door. That is when you find security. And that is when you find significance. That is when you find satisfaction. You walk through his door. There is another door that I want to share with you that Jesus felt was his most important door and that is the door of your heart. Revelation 3 verse 20 says, Jesus talking about your heart and my heart said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him and he with me. Jesus said, if you will open the door of our earthly life to him, he will open the door of our eternal life to us. I have walked through so many important doors in my life. I have walked through many different doors in my life. The most important door I have ever walked through and the most important door you will ever walk through is the door named Jesus Christ. And that is what you need. Christian faith begins 
when we make a personal decision to respond to the Christ who is knocking on the door, if we allow him, like Zacchaeus and the host of others in the biblical record, the gates of paradise will open for us. So I'm just challenging you this morning, brothers and sisters, that open your heart to Christ, who is the door for your salvation. Open your heart to Christ. Surrender your life to Christ. And you will take control of everything because he is the alpha and omega of your life. Nothing in this world would give you meaning. Nothing is meaningful in this world besides your life in Christ. And that is what John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10, is calling us. He is the door. Come to him. And live in him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I don't know where you are. In your room? With your family? But if you want to give yourself to God, to surrender God, yourself to God right now, it is the time to pray with me. Dear God, I need you. I am humbly calling out to you. I'm tired of doing things my way. Help me to start doing things your way. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Fill the emptiness in me with your Holy Spirit and make me whole. Lord, help me to trust you. Help me to love you. Help me to lie for you, to live for you. Help me to understand your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Uh, I do welcome you to our Holy Communion service. And um, I would like you to get bread and also wine or juice uh, as we start our Holy Communion service. Um, let us pray this is the table not of the church but of the Lord it is made ready for those who will love him and who want to love him more so come you who have much faith and you who have little you have been here often and you have not been for a long time you have tried to follow and you who have failed Come, not because it is I who invite you. It is our Lord. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Now let us hear the story of how this sacrament began. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he said at a supper with his disciples. When they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, and broke it and gave it to them with the words. This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then I took a cup and saying, this is the new relationship which God made possible because of my death. Drink from it and all of you to remember me. And now, so following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this juice, the ordinary things of the world, which Christ will make special and then say the prayer before sharing. Let us do so. Let us pray. Lord God, as we come to share the richness of the table, we cannot forget the rawness of the earth. We cannot take bread and forget those who are hungry, who are suffering. We cannot take juice and forget those who are thirsty. We cannot hear your word of peace and forget those who are at war. We cannot celebrate the feast of your family and forget our division. We are one in spirit, but not in fact. His and head to dismembers. For us you were born, for us you healed, preached and taught, and showed the way to heaven. 
For us, you were crucified, and for us, after death, you rose again. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, for all that you have done and all that you have promised, what have we to offer? So as we do in this place what we have done in absence, send down your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and juice so that they may become for us your body, healing and forgiving, making us whole, and that we may become for you your body and loving and caring in the world until your kingdom come. Among friends gathered, Around the table, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body, it is broken for you. And later he took the cup of wine and said, This is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take this to remember me. So I invite you to take the body of Christ that has been broken for you and remember who Jesus is in your life. Now take the blood of Christ that is shed for you. Now take the blood of Christ that is shed for you in Jesus' name. Jesus says, I am the door for the sheep so that they can come in and go out and find pasture. Let us remember his words to us. Those who believe in him, in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our first week of the month, we have got two offerings, one for our Sunday offering and the other one for Benevolent Fund to support those who are less privileged. So may we continue to do that. Let us pray. Our loving God, we come before you. It's so amazing how you have designed us. People of all shapes and sizes. People from so many cultures and lifestyles. People of all ages and abilities. People from many religions. People like you and me. Father, we pray for the offering that is being put by your people. We pray for the love that you have shown to us. That because of you, we find the heart. We find the, the love. just to give. Bless our offering, Lord. Bless us as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May God's blessing be with us as we go. A blessing from the one who calls us together. A blessing from the one who never deserts us. A blessing for life in all times and all places. A blessing from our gracious God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us from now and evermore. Amen.